money on us. Happy Easter weekend, and we've got a little got big an announcement. News. Yeah, big announcement for the money miners. We, we um we're launching something today, and I'm really excited about it. We love the show. It's a wicked fucking day job, boys. Wait, we've got the the wonderful privilege of talking about the things that the three of us love to talk about every single day, and um in exactly the fucking words that we want to use to talk about those things, which is. Amazing that there's an audience that wants to listen to that. I um, but I'm grateful nonetheless, mate. And the money miners are fucking great, aren't they? They are really, a really good audience. GCs cannot thank them enough. They are GCs, genuinely GCs. Uh, and we want to take that relationship with the money miners to the next level. We dropped the day off the show, but we're starting a daily mining newsletter. Think the same tongue-in-cheek style of our show, but succinct in your inbox each morning without any fluff, none of that promotional crap. And so if you've ever subscribed to like a letter of intent before, think kind of like that, but the mining news version, all signal, no noise, daily. I'm excited. Aren't you boys? It should be the only email, mining email you will have to open, we think. We hope. (laughs) Delete the rest of them. (laughs) (laughs) Just chuck them in the junk. (laughs) But with with the aim of just you go in there and it'll be – the links to every big mining story going around and it'll just be a one-stop shop, the shit that's catching our eye. Some funny stuff. Without going to bloody every other different publication, just go in there and it'll take you say, take you there to it. So we're sharing it for the very first time next week, Money Miners, and there's a, mm. a couple of things we want to tease out to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. get get you interested and get you on the list. Totally. Um, mate, first, before we do that bit, you came up with a name, JD, which um, – was surprising to me because Maddie's definitely the most creative. Sometimes I have a little bit of a creative spark in me. I like the <laughs> thumbnails. That's my creativity. But JD, you fucking come up with the name and we were stumped. So what did you decide to call it? This mate? one's going to be called the director's special. It's a, <laughs> it's a niche mining reference. I can't believe you didn't let me use the, the main vein. <laughs> <laughs> that worked as long as Trad didn't know what that actually meant. <laughs> I had no idea. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, this is so the the newsletter is going to be called the director special. Like we've you know fleshed out, it's going to be everything going on from the world of mining coming mm-hmm. in nice and early into your inbox. And yep. what are we going to ask the money miners to to get them on the list? So mate, look if if is a bit of a a gift to you, the money miners for for getting on board the uh, the director special mailing list. Well, we have a uh, a sign up freebie to to offer you. We we asked our favourite fund managers, this is another great privilege we have is, you know, becoming friends with a lot of fund managers in this job. We asked a bunch of our favorite ones, what are the the big bets that you're making in the market right now? And they have delivered, they've contributed, they've written up a brief succinct thesis on a big bet that they're making in the markets right now. And we aggregated those theses and we put them in a PDF and it's just, what is it? A 20 page PDF? It's short. It's yeah. Maybe less. How many fund managers? Travel. 12. 12 fund managers. 12. 12 fund managers. It's a like lot a of... soccer team plus one. One plus off the one. bench. Yep. <laughs> you got a fan as well. Jesus. So 12 right. different soccer fundies. team and the coach. Right. Yeah, and we, we asked them to speak about anything that was really catching their eye. That could be, you know, a specific company, something going on in a commodity, something in the market, you know, and we got a bunch of different types of responses. And, I mean, I, I loved reading through it, collating the sort of document there. So I think it's yep. packed full of insight. It's only 12 odd pages or something. So you'll fly pages. through it. Mm. It's fr- And it's free, mate. Free yeah. to you. Mate, for- there's even specky stock predictions in there, mate. There's everything, mate. The yeah. full slather. Yeah. yeah. Buddy, it's good. It's good shit. The, it's free for you, Money Miner. So you, you'd want to read it. It's wicked. It's it's great. We, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're stoked to be able to offer it to you. But there's a catch. There's a catch, mate. We talk about incentives all the time. And um, you need incentives in this world. Like incentives yep. drives outcomes. It's all about alignment. And so we want to. What are we? What are we? We're what are tailoring we? it to the gambling nature of Australians. <laughs> Our incentives are very clear. All we want is your email. You just have to chuck it in, and then you get this PDF free in your inbox. No, just, you have to refer no. to people. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that easy, We're getting, that easy, we're getting there. You get yours in. You get two more people. Once they confirm, you get the thing in. Mm-hmm. You got to refer more. them. You there got to refer more. them. That's just the first prize, mate. Yes, if you refer to new people. So the, the director special, then you'll get this PDF yep. in your inbox. But if you want to, you know, if you want to keep referring a bunch of people, we've staged a bunch of other, you know, potential rewards for you, depending on how much of a bloody good ones money miner you want to be. I, I don't know if I'll tease them all out, but we, we've, we've offered some pretty weird stuff. If you if you refer <laughs> ten people, you get a free slab of dingo beer. If you refer 
20, then we'll invite you to a private dinner with a bunch of uh, other GCs. Um, and then – That's capped at numbers. It's not a massive yeah. event. So yeah. the first 10 people to get 10 – they yeah. get the, there's ten cartons I of think dingo. I think it's a bit anyway. There's there's some numbers. We might like get that. generous. Uh, yeah, we might get generous. That, I mean, the point is you have to you have to get snappy. You have to get on it because there are limited spots. Right, because, just get in. And early. if you refer fifty new people to the mailing list, you, we'll actually enjoy you to sit with us on the podcast one day. Come in and do a um, Pascal. Yeah, we'll do a daily show together. Um, I don't know if that's actually something that anyone wants, but if it is something that right, someone wants, if you wants, can get you fifty can get... referrals, <laughs> mate, go your hard. So if you get referred. Then you have to refer another two people to get the PDF. Yeah, that's it. So the the Hooteroo Herald, what we previously sent out once a week, that's going to end this week. And to get the ball rolling with this one, just go in the show notes in this you know very episode you're in right now, mm-hmm. and you can click sign up. To the fifteen hundred odd of you that were already sort of signed up to the Hooteroo Herald, by the time you listen to this podcast, you would have already received an email from Money of Mine with an invitation to refer to f- two friends. To everyone else, if you if you weren't ever subscribed to that wicked weekly publication, then just go to moneymind.com right now, sign up immediately, and then um, you'll uh, have to confirm and then you'll be part of that that chain. So, mate, I'm really bloody excited about this. Oh, and there's one more thing. When you subscribe, you, um, you kind of get allocated the next GC number and every email you'll be referred to as GC number so-and-so. And for the people who bought hats, they are. If you use your email when you bought that hat, you are like GC number one or GC number two as well. So oh, mate, great! You'll be referred to that forever in the exactly. emails. David Shaw, you are GC one. GC one forever. Dave. Well done, mate. You earned it. <laughs> there we go, lads. And once again, you know, thank you to all the the money miners tuning into the show, and you know, get onto the get onto the director special email. The ma- yeah, not the main vine. Who to it's, a director's, <laughs> it's a director's special. I'm going to get right, that anyway. out of your head. <laughs> anyway, people clicked on this thumbnail to uh, listen to Will Thompson. So we yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. Sorry. That was a bloody good chat, this one. It was. American Fundy. Will Thompson from Massif. With an oh, F. With an F. Massif. Massif. <laughs> you could make so many memes with that, that name. Mate, it was a massive yarn. Bloody good, mate. Good first open transparent yarn we've had about shorting. There was only one segment of it, yeah. but I bloody love it. If it's full good. full disclosure on how he shorts and how the shorting world works, it was bloody great. But mate, we talked nickel, copper, a lot about the Lundine Group, South bloody copper in the Vicuña. Ah, uh, oh, shit. Which Cent- big chunk on Centaurus. He on yep. his uh, he was rode Centaurus. Unfortunately for him, exited on a loss. But uh, how he builds a book, what he learned from going in insurance, where it's a very different game into investing, the process of you know writing down your investments, all these sorts of things, as well as a couple you know little comments on things like tin. Oh, Trav, other- he's got a battle again. There's a he, him, and. Is it Hempton John along? Hampton. Oh, yeah, he's that one. Oh, yeah, mate. him and Hempton along on one, and there's another nah, guy that's him short. Him and Cahody's along. Oh, him and Cahody's along and Hempton, Hempton short. short. Yeah. The three yeah. are going to come Trust on me. the show. Anyway, we thought <laughs> a bloody bit of a Twitter argument going on. We yeah. thought, well, let's get the three of them together. Yeah. yeah. Get on it. Righto, here we go. <laughs> Righto, ladies and gents, we're heading across the bloody complete opposite time zone. Nothing that we love more. Over to the US. Well, Thompson. From Massive Capital, Massive with an F, not Massive, <laughs> but possibly Massive. Is it Massive? Uh, n- 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 we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> Ho- hopefully I'll get some Australian investors and uh. we'll grow a little. Ah, mate, yeah, just a small <laughs> fee attached to it on our behalf, but we're happy to help. <laughs> mate, it's better to grow with um, compounding than, than just inflows, mate. Just like, let the snow uh, Yeah, no, it. it. <laughs> It absolutely is. Oh, but, mate, uh, we interviewed you know, a year. Do, do need to add more investors. <laughs> <laughs> Will, um, there's there's a bunch of things we're keen to talk to you about, and one thing that particularly stands out with yourself uh, in comparison to some of the other Aussie fundies that we've spoken with is that you're quite forthcoming with with your short books. So I want to I want to start there. So you've there's, there's two ways to go about this one. You've spoken about how you use baskets of like ETFs to to short specific commodities when you're still long a, a stock. And there's also a, a couple names I've heard you mention in the past. So I want to start with a, a specific name, which you're not too fond of. Don't know if you're, you're short the stock at the moment, but I find it particularly interesting because we've had a, um, a fundy not too long ago talk about the the other side of this one. So I really perked up when I read in your, in your I think, most recent quarterly newsletter 
that you weren't so fond of this stock. So I'm talking about Piedmont Lithium. Can you yeah, flesh out what, <laughs> yeah, what exactly, I mean, from as far as I can tell, you're both uh, headquartered in the same state, North Carolina in, in USA. So is it, was it, you know, a bit more of a, a entire lithium dynamic and this was, you know, one that was, you know, having particularly high amounts of talk to the stock that wasn't so attractive about it or what, what was it? about Piedmont yeah. that drew your Sorry attention. Sorry for the stitch up too, Will. Jody's asked you about your short book first up and it's just like polarising the entire audience. <laughs> yeah, but it's bloody <laughs> exciting stuff. That's the shit we love. Yeah, no, I, I have no problem with that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've been accused of being too transparent at times. Um, we love it. But we I, love I, it. I, I, often, I often write for myself. I, I get to the end and... And I'm like, wow, that was really therapeutic. And then I shoot it off to investors and <laughs> see, just see what happens. Uh, Piedmont. Um, I mean, look, you, you guys talk a lot about lithium. You know lithium. Uh, it's not it's not an easy commodity. Like you can't just pull it out of the ground and just ship it off. I mean, I guess in theory you could just pull it out of the ground, ship it off to China or something. Uh, but Piedmont had uh, big plans to – Build all kinds of assets uh, for for refining the the spotamine type product that they were going to mine here into do a battery quality lithium and um, I'm a big proponent of you know sort of betting betting the jockey if you will a lot of times with mining firms you know management is critical. And you look at that management team, and I'm going to run into them at the supermarket or something here. <laughs> punch in the face, but um, you know, it's not even the B team. Um, it's uh, and then you look at the board. The the board actually doesn't. The last time I looked, the board had no one with any mining experience. I think they had they had someone who had aggregates experience, like mining, like you know rock for for concrete and cement and stuff like that yeah. they had no one with any actual mining experience no one with any lithium experience no one with any you know chemical processing experience they're just completely out of their depth uh and so you know put aside the fact that there's a lot of reasons to take a look at the united states as a possible location to mine lithium because there's a lot of incentives from the government and things like that you put aside all of that they just had no ability to execute on it. And then you looked at the stock price um, and uh, they'd managed to sell the story really well. Um, so that sort of seemed like a perfect setup to me in the face of lithium prices, you know, falling out of bed last year. And the stock held up pretty well for a little while. Um, and I was actually short it for a period of time last year where it just, it wasn't working despite the fact that lithium was tanking. Um, so that's, you know, that was Piedmont, uh, in a nutshell. Now, I mean, there are, you know, there are questions about, uh, how South Atlantic, uh, who they're tied up with is South Atlantic. I don't remember uh, the name. Yes. Siona and yeah. Atlantic. Well, Siona, yeah. oh, Atlantic Lithium. Not yeah. Yeah. There are questions about how Atlantic Lithium got permits for their assets and things like that, but that's, I don't know. They, they, Nobody cares how you get your assets in Africa, so that's not really a big deal. Um, but <laughs> Unless it comes back to buying you, know, like AVZ. Well, <laughs> no, well, or that you guys were talking about some company this morning that was interesting. Oh, it was old um, mate from Sierra Retail. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the guinea guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I have Benny yeah, yeah. Steinmetz. Ben, <laughs> Benny Steinmetz. <laughs> yes, he, he got, yes, he, they got him yeah. eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that the story is really simple. Um, it, it's just a team that, that couldn't execute on what they said they were going to. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. And then at this point, they're really just like a, a weird middleman between uh, lithium mined by Sayona and whoever the heck is buying that concentrate or wh whatever they're producing. Um, so just overpriced. Lithium was tanking. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why you'd... Uh, I don't know what the, the bull case is for it anymore. Um, you know they're not going to they 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 hope to build some processing facilities in Tennessee, uh, as you said. I live right around the corner. I've been to some of their meetings here trying to get permitting. It's not happening. No, nobody in Gastonia, North Carolina, wants anything to do with them. Um, so uh, it's pretty pretty easy. Um, so how do you how do you put it in um, 
perspective of actually b- building out the short because it's you know notoriously hard just to value a com- uh, just to short a company on valuation basis and that yeah. blows up in a lot of people's face. Uh, how do you think about the, the the momentum that the trend you know about timing of the short? Yeah, so it's taken me a long time to sort of develop a method like. The long side's much easier. You find an asset you like, you find a company you like, you find management, you buy, and there's like a time arbitrage almost. And, and that's that's the way it works. Um, but the short side's much, much harder. And it, it's taken me a long time to figure out a good methodology, for me at least. And a lot you know, in the United risky, States, oh, well, yeah, well, I mean, last year I lost all, all our losses were on the short book last year. Completely misread the market. Just got smacked around all year long on the short book. Um, but, you know, at first I started looking for, you know, stocks that were poorly valued and started there. And as you note, that didn't work. Um, and then I spent some time looking for frauds at one point, And I never find anything that I really think is a fraud. Um, maybe some things run close, but you know it, it's a real fine line there. What is and is not fraud. Oh, uh, you and Trav would get along sensationally. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my assumption is you're a fraud to start yeah, with. Yeah, right. Tra- tra- <laughs> if they're not a fraud, Trav finds a way to turn them into one. <laughs> See, my assumption is the exact opposite. I'm sort of like the economy yeah. wouldn't work if that was yes. the case. No, you're set up case. to make money in markets, mate. That's for sure. <laughs> um, Trav's not allowed to short. <laughs> 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 so eventually what I, I've come to is uh, I end up putting together a fair number of sort of custom indices with blocks of stock in different industries that I'm interested in. Um, and what I pay a great deal of attention to uh, is the breadth of the of the move. So if everything in the sector is going up, it doesn't matter how much I dislike a stock, I'm not going to short it. Um, but if an entire sector is going down, or if a whole group of stocks that I think are related are going down, I then go and find the weakest player in that group. And that's what I short. And sometimes I'll short that and the, the say, the ETF that covers the industry like a pair, um, to sort of a pair. Um, but it's all, at this point, it's moved all to sort of trend and momentum uh, type of shorting. And it gets you in, it gets you out. Like there's no value in being in the market short for a long time. Um, at least in the in the United States, there are no advantages uh, to being in in the market short for a long time. There are no tax advantages or anything like that. So I want to hit a single or a double, um, get in, get out, and and go with the trend and momentum. So I'm looking for stuff that's already falling. Then I want to sort of take the weakest player out. What, what about the your risk management side of it when you are exposing yourself to these shorts, which can freaking go infinite percents the other way? Are you, are you hedging it with a, one of your high conviction longs on the same commodity or are you putting uh, really going hard on the short side? Yeah, usually, uh, usually I don't have a long on the other side. I usually don't hedge it. It's usually open ended. Um, yeah, right. Sometimes I'll do do the hedge the other way. Sometimes I'll have a long. But like last year, I wanted to hold on to my Lithium America, uh, <laughs> and so uh, shorting Piedmont and shorting the Lithium ETF in the United States. Its ticker symbol is LIT. Um, you know, was a nice hedge to, to holding my Lithium America and Lithium Argentina. Um, but I haven't. I have. I've never done it the other way. So sometimes I'll use options if I'm nervous about the market, but uh, or nervous about it sort of going the other way. I also try to stay away from anything that's kind of meme stocky. Um, you know, so like I'm not gonna anything I mean, I you only hear deal, about in an Uber. <laughs> yeah, anything I hear about an Uber or you know whatever Donald Trumps. SPAC is that just went public, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> a- anything like that, I don't want to touch. Mm-hmm. Well, so, how uh, many mechanisms are there that you have at your in your arsenal? Like you mentioned, there's obviously just a shorting stock on borrow without leverage, like you mentioned options. What other, how, what other mechanisms are there that you can use? Uh, for me, I could trade uh, options, futures, bonds, and equity, and so I can express 
my ideas via any of those instruments. I tend to stick to equity and options. Uh, never, I've never shorted anything with futures. Um, that would that would probably take some balls I don't have, just given the implicit implicit uh, leverage there. So. Yeah. Is there is there a bit of a fight like when you're dealing with the prime brokers to get the borrow on these stocks? Is is there a bit of a fight between all the institutions that are trying to short? Who gets f- first grab at the pool that is available to short? Is there a net like have you got to be up in the chain to get priority? How does how does it all work? I'm always interested so, to know. It's such a very opaque uh, part of the industry that no one ever talks about until now. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, the the question is whether your your prime broker has got stock to lend. Um, and so the bigger the prime broker you've got, the more stock that they have to lend. And so in the United States, for example, like let's say you open up a Charlie Schwab is like a broker here in, in, in the United States that a lot of people have accounts on. You open that account and you don't pay attention. Uh, they they have in real small print somewhere. We are going to lend your stock, um, mm-hmm. and so you know you or Fidelity. We're going to lend your stock, um, and so if you've got a good prime broker, my prime broker is Goldman. They've got stock to lend all over the place, and so I have to go into a system check whether I can borrow it. If I can borrow the stock, I then go back into Bloomberg type in some codes that they give me and it says, okay, you're borrowing the stock from over here and, and that's how it works. Uh, yeah, I, I, I assume it probably works pretty similar um, throughout most of the world. And it's so the bigger the bigger mobs, like the really big mobs, they'd have accounts with UBS, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, bloody yeah, State yeah. Street, have, Every, it, everyone yeah. do they, just to get the maximum chance of getting the borrow they need. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, a lot of bigger firms tend to have more than one prime broker in the United States. Um, I don't think that's the reason, uh, but it certainly would be helpful. Um, I definitely have run into stocks every once in a while where I tried to short it, and they said we can't borrow it. Um, usually, that happens if if there's there's too many if the short interest is too high. Um, and in, in that case, I, I probably shouldn't have shorted it anyway, so maybe they saved me. Um, but uh, it doesn't happen very often. There's just not – I mean, there's not a lot of shorting going on anymore, but everyone's stock is – unless you really tell someone that you're not going to – we don't want to lend it, it's, it's usually the broker will lend it. So the absence of a large shorting market, because um, nobody does it anymore, combined with the fact that everyone's stock is borrow, borrowable – uh, probably works to my advantage. And have you had any cases where you've had a short active and the prime broker has recalled the stock before you wanted to close the position? I've had one position closed on me, but uh, that was because they couldn't actually find the stock I had borrowed. They weren't able to locate it, so that was an issue on their end. Like a bloody Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what happened there, but they said we have to close this out because you're now naked short because we don't know where the stock we lent you is. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know how that worked out or how that was solved. It wasn't my problem. Very hard um, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, but never, never had anyone close it out on me uh, other than that. But they have the ability to, don't they, with certain period of notice? Yeah, probably. I'd, I'd have to look. I mean, they definitely do. I'd have to look how much notice they need to give me. I suspect, given my size and given Goldman Sachs's sharp elbows, I, I have to suspect they, they could do it with very little short notice in my case. <laughs> Pardon the pun. You know where there is a risk or no risk for where borrow is an issue – Tell me, Matty. If you want to borrow some shit off KCA. No risk. Borrow mining equipment. Completely the opposite of the shorting market. I think there is risk. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. I thought you guys were going to get roofed on that. (laughs) There's there's no (laughs) risk that you won't get the equipment you're after, Trav. There is no risk of that. There's no risk because the the, – That's true. Water water trucks, ITs, Normits. Gotcha. Yep. Buddy, mate, because the (laughs) – 
there is no risk because Adam Wilson and KCA will buy the equipment so you can borrow it off them. Yeah. That's, for that's, a fee. That's what they do. For a fee. So yeah. that eliminates the risk because of the can-do, yes attitude of KCA. Why should mm. I call Adam? What can he give me? What's he got? Mate, he can give you, in terms of the underground environment, mate, ITs. Yes. ITs is the flagship product of KCA because they've got shitloads of them. Mate, they've got the Normet charge rigs, the Normet flatbeds. They've got an underground truck. They've got a grader. Mate, then even water, water progressing trucks. up to the surface with the water trucks, the service trucks, mate, halt like prime movers. Oh, my God. And what else is there? It's subject to change without notice because he will just buy the shit between the mate. He's bought toilets. He's bought like he's he's converted bloody Normets into water jets. Like there is nothing this company can't do if you want to hire a bit of equipment and not outlay shitloads of capital to buy it. Bit of a one stop shop, hey mate. KCA just keep servicing the industry. Love your work. Yes is the only answer. Thank, Thank you, KCA. KCA. Oh, that was in time. Very good call, cool, KCA. Back to Will. <laughs> Will, you uh, you mentioned earlier uh, Lithium Americas, and we've spoken with a, a fellow North Carolinian, Joe Lowry, who's uh-huh. he's quite excited about uh, Thacker Pass. So I mean, he likes lithium. He, <laughs> I have heard that before. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and he also likes the he likes the clays as well. So interested to hear how you've sort of put into perspective the r- relatively you know n- novel processing or n- newer processing that they're pitching and putting forward there which has, you know, really led you to, like you say, hold Lithium Americas through a bit of a, a trough cycle and hold on to it. Yeah, so originally uh, I got involved in Lithium Americas when it was one company and they really were just working on Kachari. And we initially valued the company on the basis of Kachari alone and we're like, well, Thacker Pass, we'll see what happens. This was in 2018 or 19. Um, then we got mostly out of it in 2022, I guess. It, it went to like 35, to, you know, it was a pre-production mining firm with uh, uh, two assets and it went from $2 to 40 or something like that. Um, so we got out of quite a bit of it, but held, held on to a little piece. Um, and now now we've got a, a, a small stake in both of them. I think with Thacker Pass... You know, I mean, mining firms. There's always going to be trouble turning on turning on an asset and and turning on a processing. You know, a new flow sheet. Uh, there's always going to be problems. But I think we've had conversations with. Uh, you know, we've had we've had conversations with their management team. Uh, we've uh, I've not been to site. Um, we've had conversations with. Uh, sort of uh, academics who work at the Colorado School of Mines, which is a place we go to often to sort of get expertise about the process. We reviewed a fair amount of the the literature out there that's available on the process they're using. Uh, and a lot of the individual steps are kind of like off the shelf and they, they work in other in other industries and in other places. It's it's more the application here to lithium and maybe the sequence, if you will, that's new. Um, but the individual steps on their own aren't terribly new. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a bit, I mean, these things are always a bit of a gamble. And so we've, we've taken the, the outlook that at the very least, uh, they were going to get government funding, they were going to get the mine built, uh, and that the processing would be something they would have to work on. And it's not going to work right off the bat at the yield that they want, or at least I'd be surprised if it did. Um, that should be, in my opinion, the base case. But uh, they do look like a team who's capable of working through those types of problems. Um, so that would be that would be what I'd have to say. And how about li- li- the other side of that? So like you mentioned, for, for those unfamiliar, it sort of split out your lithium... Argentina and Lithium America now. And, um, you know, Argentina has been been in the papers a bit the last half year or so politically, a lot of things changing there. Are you, I'm not sure if you still hold the stock on that part, mm-hmm. but are you, are you confident the new Milai administration will be, um, you know, advantageous? There's a lot of American interest, you know, mainly from Canadian companies with interests in, in Latin America and in Argentina. Is that going to be a, uh, a more, you know, mining friendly jurisdiction going forward. Are you confident in that? 
he, he talks a big game, um, <laughs> Melee, that is. Uh, I mean, it's the right... He seems to be taking things in the right direction, whether that translates uh, to a better environment, whether he's still in office in a couple of years. You know, they've got... Right now, his big problem, Malay's problem, is he's got a lot of things he'd like to do, but he doesn't control the legislature. His party uh, didn't get enough seats. I, I don't remember what the, the ratio is, but you know, if there are 100 seats in the Argentinian legislature, his party only controls like 10 or something. You know, it's that type of thing. Um, so a lot of the proposals he's made have gotten kicked back uh, to him. And, and so there's been progress. He appears to be making progress. He's definitely the type of politician that you'd want in power. And it's going to be a waiting game to see. But I think, you know, when it comes to political risk, like like you have in Argentina, my perspective has always been that it's more about the management team's ability to work through the problems that they're confronted with than it is, you know, what kind of politician you get there. You, you, you know, you've got people like the Lundins who have had success in Argentina over and over again, or had success in Ecuador. And, you know, you got Friedland who's had success in the DRC. So, you know, the right people can build a mine in the worst places uh, that would theoretically have a lot of political risk. But in fact, the political risk is, is more a function of the management team than it is the country itself. So I think he seems like the kind of guy you could work with. Yep, yep. And, and that's, that's important. You've spoken about the Lundines in, in previous podcasts as well, and um, obviously a, a, a big you know mining family, very very high pedigree, and there's, there's a couple rumours or maybe sort of wishful thinking from from some people we've spoken with not too long ago that they're going to um you know their ne- their next massive move is going to be to tie up the the Vicuña district. Have you have you got any sort of you know hope in that? Have you got any vested interest in that tie up? Yeah, the I mean, people that said that. Have got the vested interest, <laughs> don't they? Yeah, they yeah. need it, it tied was, up. It was <laughs> hopeful thinking on their part, but, oh, yeah. it, but it's fascinating because it, you know, in a sense, does make sense. The the synergies, the the capex that needs to be sunk there is phenomenal. They yeah. need a lot of things to go right, and you know, there's some there's some big players you got. To be fair, they've executed brilliantly so far. Though. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the Lundine family have a, a history of executing very well. So if you know if someone's yeah, going to so do it, they wouldn't be the worst people to do it. No, no, no. And full transparency invested in uh, Philo, NGX, and Lundin Mining for like two years now. So um, in it for for a while. Uh, I would love for them to tie it all up and make it one nice, neat package. Uh, that would be great. I don't really know if that would be the best thing for the Lundin mining balance sheet. And I don't really know if they could pull it off in a way that allowed them to maintain, they like to maintain a stake of sort of like 30%. Like that seems like their ideal. Just if you look look across their companies, that, that's sort of what they, they seem to like to control. Um, I'd be surprised if they could tie it all together and retain 30%, just given the size of the projects and things of that nature. Um, How much capital could they deploy, but, the London Group, realistically? I don't know. That's a good question. Because um, the, the group, I don't know what the group could deploy. Um, definitely be a couple billion, uh, probably. Um, but that wouldn't do but the I, job. I, no. Yeah, that, w- that wouldn't do the job. Um, you know, that would, you know, consolidate one and then you've got to figure out how to build two giant mines. So, you know, it, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they can do it necessarily. They could certainly give it a shot, and, uh, but it seems like it makes more sense, at least at the, at the start, um, you know they've got they've got a tight relationship with the Japanese trading firms, a couple of which are in 
uh, I don't remember which, it's either Philo or, NG, it must be Philo, I think, um, or NGX, one of, the, one of the, the trading firms is in there, BHP is there, you know, they've definitely had conversations with Freeport, you know, they have that long relationship with Freeport back from, um, what was the, uh, they used to own uh, Tanky, Fung- uh, Tanky Fungarima. Yeah, the one that Seymour uh, yeah. bought. Yeah, yeah, Tanky yeah. Fungarima. Um, yeah, so, you know, they know how to work with Freeport. Um, so they got plenty of good partners. Uh, I think it makes more sense to at least get the ball rolling uh, with a partner. Um, I'm not sure that Jose Maria, which is in Lundin Mining, is the first asset to build. I, I think uh, Philo or NGX uh, looks a little more prospective to me as the first asset to build. Um, there's other things that Lundin Mining can do uh, with some of their other assets, I think that are maybe first on the list, are a little they, lower hanging fruit. Are they pretty? So they're pretty amenable to having a a JV partner like a BHP or a Freeport or a Rio or something like that, or do they totally. they wanted yeah. that's that's their preference? Is it? Uh, I don't know if it's their preference, but they're definitely amenable to it. At least that's my understanding, um, and they definitely have a, a history of doing it um, both you know, on the mining side, obviously, and then on the oil and natural gas side. I mean, their assets are always, you know, they they find these elephants all the time, it seems like, and uh, they're never quite big enough to build them just by themselves. But um, when they do build them, they, they seem to find a good partner and execute well. So You look at BHP's private placement into Philo, you don't get a private placement away unless you're, you know, like pretty open-minded about having them as a, as a development yeah. partner. Yeah. yeah. What do they own in Philo? BHP. I think seven percent. Yeah, right? you're probably right, JD. Yeah. Something like that. That sounds that. about right. Something in that area. Yeah. 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 So I mean, copper, copper more broadly has been it's been moving lately. There's been some interesting stuff we've spoken about on the show with regards to treatment and refining charges, and we've seen a, a noticeable uptick in in the price, and not just the price, but the sentiment lately as well around copper has gotten gotten a bit a bit sort of bullish lately is is that you know feeling the same over over you know stateside with you yeah uh for sure i think the it, it's actually caught me a little by surprise how quick the sentiment seems to have changed um when you look at sort of like commitment of traders reports and things like that about futures um hedge funds are all have all been shorting copper for a while now. Um, and now they're all sort of cycling out of it. Uh, they're all rushing for the door at the same time, it seems like. So from a, a sentiment perspective, it definitely seems at least at least like hedge funds have changed their mind on it. Um, and you're starting to see more sort of discussion about it in general financial sort of press. Uh, so it, it seems quite tightly correlated with the idea that we're sort of going to skate through uh, from an economic perspective without maybe hitting a recession or without hitting the skids too badly, sort of a... No landing. What we now... Yeah, no landing. What we now call no landing, whether (laughs) whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but um, definitely some pickup in sentiment there. And then I think the, you know, the Chinese coming out and saying, we're going to try and do, you know, 5% GDP growth this year, and that's going to be you know, heavy investment in uh, what is what is she called it? The new productive forces. You know, uh, renewable semiconductors and EVs, all copper intensive. Um, so I think that uh, puts some more people at ease, um, just because the the concern, or at least the story in the United States, if you if you listen to sell side talking about copper, it's always like just a straight Chinese real estate story there's like nothing else um now they've sort of backed off of that a little bit or have a more sort of complete picture of china uh so the sentiment's definitely changed it seems real uh, we'll have to see what happens another thing you need shitloads of copper wire for will all of Smec Power and Technologies equipment, the HV feed, the low voltage feed, get feeding the Smec VSDs, the vent on demands, the jumbo boxes, the substations, the mate, the pump starter boxes, everything that Smec can build and manufacture in their workshop and install on site. They are electrical gurus for the mining industry. The electrical experts, eh? 
Mate, they're, they're just to, they're, they know their lane. Their lane is power. But Everything you need. It's just it's here in Perth. Mate, it's, it's ready waiting. Built in Perth, like the work they've expanded the workshop. There's blue boxes coming out the wazoo there. So the mate, I know we harp on about the VSDs and vent on demand, which are just an absolute mandatory thing for your secondary ventilation system, but it's only one small piece of the smack pie because the, mate, they do everything and they have just mate what an industry standing for electrical. If you've got the mining industry. Electrify the world, mate. You want to do it efficiently. And yep. smack are the people to do that. I just I, I still can't believe that every mine doesn't have a VSD to drop half their diesel consumption for power. I just still can't understand it. It saves you money. It saves you shitloads of money. Half your diesel gone that you would have used for your secondary ventilation. It's a no-brainer. You've got to get one and you've got to get smack to put it in for you. And it mate, those VSDs. They'll bloody – they bolt onto any bloody fan. That is what they do. It could be the oldest fan you've got, a VSD will work on it. Call Marty Law. said. Call Marty Law. Yeah, Back God, to Will. We digress. Now, Will. On that – on that, um, like, like, so copper's a, a, a theme, and I've heard you talk in the past about having an idea, but it's one thing to have an idea or, like, know a theme to back, but then you need to come up with the best way to express that idea in the market. Yeah. So take, take copper, for example, right? Um, if you think that there's like a, 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 an outsized, like you can buy you can buy a dollar for 50 cents, for example, by, by having an idea in that area. What would your process look like to actually identify the best idea there? I mean, I would, so our research suggests that when you look at mining firms, I mean, first you've got to decide whether you want the straight copper exposure or if you want to own a mining firm. I mean, that's, you know, you got to make that decision first. Um, me, I run a fund that can trade futures, but that's not what we do. We're not a commodity trading firm. Um, so I could take a position in copper, uh, but it's it's not really what I'm paid for. Um, so, so I immediately sort of focus on companies. Uh, then, you know, wh- where do you want to be on the spectrum of producer to development? And if you're going to something like Freeport McMoran or Southern Copper Company or, or any of these big producers, really what you're doing is you're just making a straight commodity bet, but doing it through equities. Because those stocks just trade with the underlying commodity. And so you just have a straight bet on the commodity price with the potential risks that come with operating a mine, but very little upside, right? Because what what does Freeport McMoran have to do to move the needle? Well, it needs to find like another Grassberg, uh, or it needs to tie itself up with with the Lundines or something. So so it, it it's got to make a move, and and it's not going to telegraph what that move is to us ahead of time. Um, so I, I'm not a big fan of producers. Uh, unless I can buy them at like the very bottom of the cycle. Uh, so I would then steer towards juniors and development. Um, and uh, I tend to start with the management team. Um, and then and from there, I then sort of go to the asset. And if I can tie up an asset that I like uh, with a management team that I like, that's that's you know 80% of the way there, or 75% you, of the way there. So if you, if you did go long on Freeport and in anticipation it's going to follow the copper price. Do you, are you are you a bit more leveraged? Like, as you said, you take on the risks of the operation and the business, but uh, is there more leverage to the upside or when you are buying futures, you it's in a leveraged position as well? How does that all work? Yeah, I mean, leverage in the futures is uh, 10, uh, 10 to 1, so it's hard to beat that kind of leverage. Um, you're not going to get that leverage from Freeport, uh, but it's definitely levered to the copper price. It'll definitely move, or at least in theory, you know, and it's quite, that's quite a textbook theory though. In theory, it should move more than the copper price. Um, does it, you know, I don't know. I mean, the other, the other way to think about it, and I know some people who do this is they, they take the opposite approach to me. Um, they say, well, what is the crappiest asset? Because the crappiest asset is going to have the absolute most, most leverage talk. to the copper price. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's um, what I call talk. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, 
you know, who's the, you know, so that that's a Piedmont lithium, right? Piedmont lithium <laughs> went to 60 um, or something before they even had permits for a mine. And Lithium Americas, you know, it did well, but it didn't didn't make that kind of move. Um, so uh, that's that's another way to do it. Um, not not my favorite way of doing I like, it. I like the idea of finding like a crap asset with a pretty good management team because you're not and without balance sheet like pressure as well because a good good management team with a crap asset will probably like never actually like lose money in bad market. They'll find a way to cut costs appropriately, cut production and and stay kind of like like protected. But then triple your margin yeah, in then a bloody shit in, in a, a good a environment. A rising market like they've got yeah. the most talk. And those are um, really, yeah. really neat opportunities. Talk's our well, new favourite word. Like, <laughs> love it. What is it? Talk. talk. It translates talk. to leverage, essentially. Just, just talk. Oh, oh, torque. 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 Yeah, yeah. mate. Torque. Yeah. Like a torque. bloody, like gotcha. a big diesel Land Cruiser, mate. Just <laughs> got the torque. Well, that's, um, I mean, that idea, I think, is uh, I've got a position in uh, Equinox Gold. Yeah. Ross Beatty's gold mining. Those assets are... I mean, Greenstone, the new asset in Canada, is a great asset, but the rest of the assets are pretty high cost. And so that does create, you know, that's a good management team with a handful of assets that are mediocre and one one great asset. Um, but that, their average all-in sustaining cost is too high, but that'll create a lot of torque to the gold price. And Ross Beatty probably... You know, kind of like a Mark Clark down here, just doubles the doubles the multiple of the company just by being there himself. Yeah, a little bit for sure. So, for sure. Will you you seem to be you know pretty methodical about how you think about these investments? And if I heard right in a, a recent podcast you did, there was only a perhaps a, a couple dozen of companies you'd invested in over you know a, a number of years. That seems to be a bit of a different style to a lot of the fundies we speak with, who are mm. you know. You know, at, at any one time, they could be holding that many different names. Is, is that right to sort of th- think about how how you so, go about your investment yeah, I process? Hold, I hold no more than 16 positions on the long side um, at any one time and maximum 16 positions on the short side, although I've never come anywhere close to that. Um, average position size, like unless I can put 6% of the portfolio into it, Probably not. Uh, I mean, sometimes I, I don't put 6% of the portfolio in. Um, but those are, you know, that's sort of like my starting position size. Um, and then my average holding period is sort of three to five years. So pretty low turnover in the grand scheme of things and relatively concentrated. I think my top five positions are represent 50% of my portfolio right now. And Maybe my top eight represents seventy or something. Gotcha. And you you spoke about in your your past in um, insurance work the the symmetry of you know now what you're doing in in bets in investments and previously in in building a insurance book and the the symmetry of the positions is completely flipped. Whereas when you're you're running it on the other side, you know one bad one completely ruins your ruins your book, ruins your your day, your year, everything. But on the on the flip side here, with what you do with the the volatility in the in the business we're in, h- how do you think about the the symmetry on the flip side where one investment can have a outsized beneficial return? How's that sort of guided, and is that something you were drawn to in in mining specifically, or just in investing more broadly and getting out of insurance? Uh, drawn to mining. Why was I drawn to mining? Yeah, I was a philosophy major who then studied government. How did I get into mining? <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, who, who is that character you, you, you guys spoke about this morning running the uh, the diamond mine? Benny Steinmetz. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I got into mining because Jerry I thought Sugg. stories like that were amusing. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as opposed to, to, to stories like uh, – you know who, who's your character if you're if you're investing in tech? Mark Zuckerberg or something? Like, come on, oh, that's yeah, a boring. Such a now, you can, loose unit. now you can go to site visits <laughs> to Sierra Leone with Trav and enjoy, enjoy <laughs> that. <laughs> that sounds good. I, I've got a position in Alpha Men. I'm desperate to get out to the DRC. Oh, oh if, um, if you're going, let us know. I'm keen to go. Yeah. Go to the, the okay. Congo. I've been trying to <laughs> arrange it for a little while, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably not going to happen. Um, no, I mean the the. Uh, I got into mining first the uh, I wrote my master's thesis on political risk 
And so uh, in studying political risk, I generally focused on natural resources companies. Uh, and so that was where I sort of got started with mining and oil and natural gas and things of that nature. Then insurance, uh, it was all dealing with commodity traders and people building assets looking for political risk insurance. Um, and it just made sense to, to when I decided to leave insurance uh, to go to the other side because we were running such a clean book. We were identifying the risks and avoiding them. Um, but we weren't benefiting at all. There was no, you know, there was no upside outside the premium. Um, so it, it made sense to focus. And then in the United States, uh, and I don't know what it's like in Australia, you guys will have to tell me, but n nobody knows anything about mining. Um, okay, in Canada, they know a little bit about mining, um, but uh, nobody knows anything in the United States. So I'm, I'm always the only person sitting at the table or sitting in the room when I go to like a conference that focuses on mining. So my competition is much more limited. Um, so I, I don't need to, I often say that mining is one of the few industries where just doing the work is enough to give you an edge. Like I don't have an edge in tech by just you know, doing the work, just understanding what the business is, that's not enough to give me an edge in tech. But oftentimes in mining, just a vague familiarity with the fact that mining requires you to do more than just dig a hole in the ground um, makes you, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else. Yeah, it's very, it's very niche, similar over here. It's niche. There's either a group of, small group of people that know a lot about it than the rest that know nothing about it. Yeah. Yeah, and even so, even just like from a valuation a, perspective, like it's like if you're if you're trying to compete in the tech world, like you've got to have some idea of like, oh, you know, should should this company trade on twenty times or forty times? And that's a, <laughs> that's a very airy fairy much harder skill to set, value. like yeah. really tricky to yeah, do. But much harder. Mining is like quite neat in some ways because should this everything trade on three or five? everything should have an MPV. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I I mean I think that. Um, what what we call liquid real assets, mining, energy, uh, materials in general, a couple of industrial businesses, you know, th they should be relatively straightforward to to value, um, and I, I think that's that's important. Uh, they have simple balance sheets; they're easy to understand. Um, you end up with a bunch of science and tech uh, on processing stuff that's interesting to dig into, um, but you know, in comparison to biotech or something. So uh, it's easier to wrap your hands around it. It's easier to bring bring new commodities and new businesses into your circle of competence. You've, you've got a global uh, a global mandate as well. Do you, do you always hedge your your currency risk, or how do you think about that? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, when I first started, I debated quite a bit about it, it, only to step back and say, wait a second, I don't know anything about currencies, so I, I don't even know what I'm debating with myself, whether I should hedge or not. <laughs> um, so then I did a bunch of work trying to understand hedging, and the end result really came out to be uh, kind of a push, if you will, um, meaning there are some people who are really good with cu currencies, and they could hedge your currencies properly, but... The people who can do that are usually good enough that they're currency traders. They're not, you know, equity guys. Everyone else, uh, whether you, you know, whether you get it right or not, is kind of a coin flip. Um, and so we don't actually hedge our currency risk. I'm sort of actually more satisfied with a basket of currencies uh, than I am with any one currency. Now, admittedly, that has not worked for the last couple of years because the U.S. dollar has been so strong. Um, but what are the odds that I would have bet it had been this strong and hedged things? Pro you know, I, I, uh, I also have clients in Singapore and I have clients in the EU and, you know, so they have all these other currency issues. It's just easier for me to hold a basket, I think. So I, I, I one less decision to make. So I do you diversify the currencies, are you saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, does, does they diversify it by the investments. Yeah, so when, when you're saying you hold 16 stocks, does the currency and where it is play a part, a bit of a part in it, which that making up that 16? It doesn't. No, no. It's I mean, it's completely random. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, look, there, there's currency. There are some risks that you just accept, and that's 
that currency risk I just accept because I, I can't hedge it intelligently. I'd be wrong as often as I was right. And so it's just, you know, no point in dealing with it. Yeah. You also um you you write quite a bit and you you know, you do these pretty lengthy uh, quarterly newsletters as well as some some white papers on particular stocks or or topics and whatnot. And like you, I think you said at the beginning of the show there, you often end up just whipping yourself in these in these newsletters. They're quite they're quite frank and open that you write. I'm I'm super <coughs> interested to hear about how that actually plays plays its role in your investment process. That that aspect of you know self reflection and actually understanding what you're you're writing about is that a key part of the process for you? I think it is. Um, I mean, look, we. Uh, Anyone who invests for a living, it's kind of a unique, I mean, everybody's job is unique in its own way. Um, one of the things that's unique about our job is every day, at the end of the day, I'm told I'm either an idiot or I'm brilliant. And it's, it's always one or the two. It's never like, okay, you performed okay today. It's either you're an idiot or you, you're brilliant. Um, and so we get a lot of feedback, uh, but trying to understand what that feedback means is really hard and trying to improve, you know, like, uh, reading a balance sheet is taught to people and it, it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty easy. It's n n very hard to, like once you understand a balance sheet, it's very hard to say, improve how you read a balance sheet and improve your balance sheet analysis, right? Um, but the process of investing, there's a lot of room for improvement in the process um, and there's a lot of judgment calls to be made all over the place. So you have to identify every judgment call and you have to track all the judgment calls, whether you, you know, did I make a, I made a judgment call. Was this judgment call right uh, because my analysis was right or was it right because I just got lucky? Um, because, you know, being right just because I got lucky is the same thing as being wrong as far as I'm concerned. Um, it, it, it's easier for my investors to deal with uh, because the outcome work to their advantage. But, you know, I've got to be able to repeatedly make a lot of decisions uh, and have as many of them be right as possible. Um, so that intense introspection is quite important to continuous improvement and sort of uh, creating a reliable process, at least in my opinion. So... Yeah, I, I I love that sort of response. And you know, d digging into a, a particular example, you you wrote about Centaurus, I think two oh. two years ago now, and oh. it's also got mentions in newsletters. And uh, I'm I'm sorry to bring this one up, given given no, everything no, that's no, happened. But <laughs> I, you know, we spoke about the company the other day, and we, you know, we we like it. It's it's not a bad project. It's the the commodity itself that's you know really. Gone, gone against you in this one. Not necessarily project yeah. project risks, although you know, perhaps you could say they've they've pushed back the, the DFS quite a few times and whatnot. But um, what what's the thinking on the on the company now and how they're how they're progressing? Um, so uh, for transparency, I'm out of the position. I keep it on a watch list. I want to get back into it. I think the project is great. Um, or at least, at the very least, is one of the much better nickel projects around. Uh, you know, look, we we invested in it. We just didn't pay enough attention to the mac. You know, the macro environment around nickel. Uh, we got our heads sort of. We were, we were sort of head down, thinking about EVs and battery metals. And we looked over there what Indonesia was doing, and we we're like, eh, Indonesia, whatever. They're not going to figure this out, and they're not going to do this. Um, they're, uh, you know, I, we we just misread what everyone else was doing uh, completely, and just got completely sucked in to studying the company and the asset uh, with no thought whatsoever for the headwinds and tailwinds in the nickel industry. Um, and so now. You know, it's has nickel bottomed out. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Um, I know you had Rick Rule on a little while ago, and I think he he was sort of somewhat optimistic that maybe nickel was bottoming. Um, Indonesia seems to have an endless supply and an endless willingness to just pump out nickel, though. So I'm not sure. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of things I think in investing, and this is why that continuous sort of like uh, self-reflection is important. There are so many variables that even the really obvious ones, every once in a while, you just sort of don't give it as much attention as it deserves. Um, and in the case of Centaurus, uh, we just didn't give the headwinds and tailwinds for nickel as much attention as it deserved. Um, and so, you know, that's a mistake I don't want to make again. I'm sure I will make it again, but um, I'd like to avoid it if possible. I think our comment the other day <clears throat> was that it, it just appeared on – from the scoping study, I know a lot's changing on their methodology and probably inflation since 2021, but it just looked like one of those projects that – a class one nickel project that might actually survive a low nickel price environment that we're in now, which is, yep. you know, a bit of a dime of a dozen. Um, yep. There's not many of them around. Um, nope. I agree. I agree. Um, but uh, I think the – our timing it was just, it was, yeah, yeah. You, you got to build it first. They got to finance it. Our timing was just terrible, and uh, I sort of saw the writing on the wall. And uh, I could still own it, and I'd be down like, I don't know. I mean, it'd be it'd be nasty at this point. Um, but it was easier easier to get out of it and come back to it later. It's, it sounds like the reflection on on that one is is almost like like the most important thing in mining investment is actually not getting the commodity tail wind or, or headwind completely wrong um, in some ways because even if you get the yeah, company at, le right, at least not that wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, like, like nickel, we just got just, yeah. just you brutally the only wrong. One. You weren't the only one, don't worry. But yeah, it's pretty rare that you do. Like, yeah. I mean, what's the analogy when you have just a whole bunch of supply kind of come online at a completely different part of the cost curve? Maybe the Kazakhs when they got ISR cranking in, in uranium, right? That's maybe an, an analogy, but... Um, and that just changes the entire kind of picture for the rest of the commodity. Very, very yeah, quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Indonesia, it, it blew my mind. Um, so uh, I still don't – it's still not clear to me whether all that nickel is really like battery quality. Um, but – and I, I, I still don't quite understand what they think they're doing. Um, I know that, you know, they, they've tried to get copper smelters up and running there, and I guess they've had success doing that. Um, I guess they're trying to repeat that. but And I, and now they want to build EVs there. I don't know. I, I, I can't quite get a read on what uh, what they think uh, they're doing in the nickel space. So. Yeah, I mean, they're certainly not the, the first country to try and nationalize more of the more of the, the downstream, in a sense, and, you know, not let the, yeah. the export of raw materials. And like you say, the trying to do the same with, with copper, with the massive smelter being built, uh, being forced on, on Freeport. Having, having, you know, experienced that lesson and had that, you know, learning curve, are there things out there at the moment, you know, company or commodity or anything like that, that you think are as misunderstood or even to a lesser extent, just, you know, a very contrarian view that, that you have that people are missing in the in the market like like the wave of nickel that came on that seemed to be missed by by plenty of people um i think there are plenty of misunderstood markets you rattle off an endless list of those tin um uh, t tin uh t tin's board just sort of like ignored um uh, oh, but <laughs> just infuriated tin, tin and sierra rutal are not ignored by trap you've just infuriated okay. about 16 people on twitter <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of people on twitter um uh you know and like rare, rare earth metals are really hard um mm. i got I got swept up in uh, ionic rare earths, and that that didn't work out for me. Um, I didn't understand. I didn't understand rare earth metals anywhere close to well enough. Uh, and then I think you guys had someone on recently talking about graphite. Graphite's a tough one too. Yeah. Um, I mean, lithium. People don't really understand lithium. Lithium's really complicated. Uh, so a lot of markets that are misunderstood. I can't really identify anything like nickel. Or, or that might be subject to the the same sort of issues that nickel uh, is subject to right now. On, nothing, nothing comes to mind. On, so. on lithium, you, you spoke about this in a in a recent podcast, and I'll probably just ask it in the most upfront way possible because I think that's easiest. But do, do you think China is 
ramping up their and what they've done in the in the past year or two their lipidolite to ultimately buy Western assets cheaper. Is that the sort of you know view you kind of have? I I'm not going to say that's exactly what they're doing and and like it's a a plan that that G has hatched in Beijing and they're executing on it. It's certainly a possibility. It's certainly a rumor. Uh, they certainly seem to have tried it in the past with like they did have a very specific plan that there is documentation for in regards to iron ore. Um, and they that didn't work. It, too big a market. Um, WA or at least I, I just yeah, I, I, it's just too big a market to try that in. Um, I'm not sure if they're doing that or not, uh, but it's, you know, that's a rumor that, that exists out there. And it's just something I, I sort of keep in the back of my mind. Uh, it's not something I'm going to bet on. Um, it just sort of informs the mosaic of information that I've got. Um, I do think countries like China, uh, especially sort of under Xi have increasingly, you know, sort of looked at economic activity as a, as a tool. Um, you know, uh, there's a famous uh, Car Carl von Clausewitz quote, um, war is politics by other means. The Chinese view economics as politics by other means. Uh, and, and everything is politics to them and is about the preservation and uh, extension of the CCP and, and the state. Uh, so it wouldn't put, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was something they were thinking about when they were, you know, s sort of supporting uh, lithium development from uh, in China. What I'd also say is that, you know, I, I think China very much looks at, at entire supply, supply chains. So they don't need to make money mining lithium in China. They just need to make money at the very end, selling EVs in Mexico or something. Um, so they do, they definitely have a broader lens through which they look at uh, supply chains or value chains, I think. Do you think uranium set, setting itself up to be misunderstood? Is it misunderstood now, structurally? Is uranium misunderstood structurally? Uh, I'm not sure that uranium mining and the production of, you know, uranium, like yellow cake and stuff like that is, but the rest of the chain uh, and where there are, um, you know, bottlenecks and things like that through the development of, you know, through the enrichment process and, and, and the fuel uh uh, rod development, stuff like that, that part of, of the uranium industry is definitely opaque and misunderstood. Um, there's no doubt about that. I think people have a, you know, have a good understanding of, you know, how much uranium Cameco can mine, Kaz Adam Prom, things like that. Um, but it's, it's the rest of it, everything that comes after, uh, that I don't think is particularly well understood. Cause that, that seems like one of the things that could pop this whole bloody uranium thing in the future is like, you know, talking about all these SMRs coming online, but if there's no nowhere near enough enrichment capacity to deliver the HALU, then that means, well, what's the point of building SMRs if you can't enrich it, completely separate to the yellow cake supply to that? It looks yeah. like one possibility that could be a reason why this might this prophecy might not come true. I, I think that's a perfectly sort of reasonable argument. My only response to that would be that I do think there are certain there are certain uh, technologies and uh, sort of refining capabilities that we seem to have lost in the West. So, like the the ability to turn uh, rare earth metals into sort of usable metals, um, based on what I've read. Like you can't find anyone in the United States who knows how to do that anymore. Like that, that's a, that's kind of a, that's gone to China and, and we've forgotten how to do it, if you will. Um, but I do think that enrichment process, we still understand how to do that and we can still execute on it. So, so that's more a function of finding the right people, uh, the right financing, uh, and there being sort of time to build. Um, so. Will, I've got to ask you about 
a specific stock and it's one that probably Australians will not know at all. Um, but I'm curious just because you're, you obviously you're a long and short investor. Um, my fa- my favorite, like, you know, short seller of all time is a guy called John Hampton and another okay, one who yeah. I, you know, who, who, um, is, is a really interesting character is, is Mark Cahodes. Now Cahodes is ultra long okay. and Ovix. You are long <laughs> and Ovix. Hampton publicly ridicules Cahodes on Twitter these days for an Ovix. I'm pretty oh, yeah. sure he thinks okay. it's a sad a fraud. breakup. I think he thinks it's a fraud. Um, that's my gut feel. Does but he think d- uh, everything's a fraud to him? He, he runs he like is, a book with like He's very cynical. Shorts. He's like me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you're, you are correct, I think. Um, anyway. <laughs> So, so why, like you're a, you're a, you're a short seller who looks for frauds too. Why is a Novix not a fraud? Uh, well, so just to be clear, <laughs> I did look for frauds at one point and I couldn't find them. So I couldn't find them. Um, uh, why is Anovix not a fraud? Um, I, I'm just not sure why, why it, I'm not even sure why it is a fraud uh, or why that question's even being asked. Like, look, they, they've they've got technology. Uh, I have seen the technology. Other people have seen the technology. They've got a lot of very smart, very serious people on the board who have seen the technology. Uh, they have spades in the ground building out a factory. Um, like, maybe the tech, you know, m- maybe it still doesn't work because the business fails but that doesn't make it a fraud that just makes it a business failure and that happens every day um like fraud requires uh someone to say i want to hoodwink people or or i want to take advantage of people or i'm going to just straight up lie about what's going on like that guy uh was it rivian you know they made the ad about the the trucks going down the hill and and in reality the trucks didn't even work so they just was it uh, nicola the frames Oh, Nicola. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. N- Nicola. And so they put the trucks on the top of they the hill. They down the hill. Push. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that is lying and fraud. Like Definitely. there's nothing fraudulent about Enovix. Maybe there's no market for their product. That's a possibility. Uh, maybe the pricing that they think they're going to be able to get for their batteries that they've talked about is too high. That is a possibility too. Uh but that doesn't make it a fraud. That just means that they have misread the market. Um, and it's, it's uh, admittedly, it's, it's on me as a portfolio manager to figure that out, to, to try and determine whether the story they're telling, uh, whether there's narrative and numbers uh, that sync up with the story they're telling. I think the narrative and the numbers mostly sync up. What's the chances of getting the three of yous on together for a podcast with us? Zero. Captain and me. <laughs> uh, but they, the I other two no don't idea. like each other either. So okay, I yeah. I, uh, I know of both idea. of them, and I I actually do enjoy both of them on Twitter. So yeah. um, may, maybe I could. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Facilitate. <laughs> Facilitate. <laughs> well, there's one more company I want to ask you about. You've been invested in the past in Adriatic. They've, they've you know, yeah. started producing concentrate. Now um, we've, yeah, we've, we've actually spoken with the team about a year ago now and um, a, a lot of different attractive things, although polymetallic project has difficulties. The ground is very, very tough out there. You know, nevertheless, the company is valued, I'm pretty sure last time I looked at over – over one times nav, so pretty pretty fully valued. What's your what's your thoughts on how they've sort of got themselves into into concentrate production? And I'm not sure if, how closely you still follow it, but do you think they're through the the worst of that phase? Um, well, so I sold out in August of last year, August September of last year. Oh, right that's when they did the capital prices, raise, didn't actually. they? I did. Or early uh, August, they did. Surprise, for, yeah. for exploration, of course. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, so I've been out of it for a while. I still get emails from them, so I, I have kept an eye on it, um, a, a, a limited eye on it. Um, I was a little. I liked the project. Uh, I liked the team. I was a little concerned with how smoothly ramping up 
the processing would go because it was polymetallic. And so when it hit what I thought was a reasonable value, which was about $4, I was like, I'm out of here. Um, they've got some interesting prospective sort of exploration territory. So uh, there's definitely, there definitely could be more to that company. They seem to have ramped up relatively smoothly, but uh, I haven't I haven't followed it well enough to really be able to say. Um, there does, they do seem to have some other potential assets that could be interesting. It's one I keep on a watch list and, and say to myself, uh, I'll, I'll come back to it after you know it sells off uh, once it's, it's fully in production um, and they, they start the, the next you know the next cycle. We'll see if they can be a team that builds multiple mines. Some teams can, some teams can't. so we'll have to see. Oh, mate, can you tell us what's your biggest long and what's your biggest short in the portfolio? Uh, well, actually, uh, cleared out the entire short book in middle of February. Yep. Um, so I've got no shorts on the books right now. Um, when As I moved from trying to find shorts for valuation or fraud or stuff like that and more towards sort of a trend and momentum style, uh, my net. Um, or, or the, the size of my short book moves around a lot. Um, so I, I'll whip around from, uh, you know, right now I've got a gross or a, I've got a net of like 105 to a net of 35 over the course of a week or something. Um, so I, I'll swing it around quite dramatically sometimes. Uh, so I've got no shorts on the book. Um, uh, big as long as Siemens Energy. Uh, it's about... 11% of the portfolio at this point. Probably probably need to trim it a little bit. Fascinating. There you go, Siemens. No, nothing about it. <laughs> Mate, I'm in. I'm having a research after this. Good, just, yeah. Good on you, Colin. Uh, Send us any documentation gas, you got. <laughs> ga gas turbines, wind turbines, uh, and uh, the grid, the electrical grid. <laughs> They're like an EPC for the electrical grid. Yeah, awesome. That's beauty. I, I love the... Um, I love the structure of the fund, how you look at, you know, like you say, liquid hard assets. It's a, you know, a fascinating few few sectors or one big sector, if you like, to to look at. So really appreciate you making the time to to chat with us and learn a bit more about Massive Capital, Will. Absolutely. Thrilled to do it and happy to come back at any time. Yeah, bloody. But yeah, as I said, you're the first person that's had full transparency and given good education on how the shorting market works because <laughs> we just, no one ever talks about it. So that was, that was... That was my favorite bit. I don't yeah. know if it was everyone else, but that was yeah. fucking awesome. Uh, it was. Uh, is great. there is there not a lot of shorting in Australia? I mean, there's no, 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 there's shit lines, States, but I mean, none of them is, want to admit they okay. do it. And yeah. <laughs> it stops them getting meetings with other man with management. That's the issue. Yeah, so. yeah. I had that once. We we stopped. I don't. Uh, you'll notice in my letters we talk about some shorts, but we're sort of like quite deliberate about it. Yeah. Because we we had shorted a, a company at one point and put out a short report on them, um, and uh, it got picked up by a paper in the U.S. called Barrons, um, and, and then it got plastered all over the place. And uh, then, of course, management would not talk with us at all. <laughs> we, like, we, we better just we better just calm it down. Maybe when the shorts are, maybe when we exit the shorts, we talk about them, or you know. Mm. So we we walk a bit of a fine line, pick and choose which ones we talk about. Well, we haven't got any active at the moment, mate. So all the meetings will be yeah, open. Yeah. So <laughs> great. yeah, all the meetings. Are great open. plug. So, the Piedmont yeah. shareholders will still be young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that was <laughs> sensational. Why eh? we yeah. bloody thanks for your time. We'll let you go to bed. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Will. Cool. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, guys. That was a that was a friggin' ripper. Mm. As I said, oh, man, that bloody short talk's got giving me a stiffy. That's uh, bloody brilliant. Oh, I love the transparency. So, it's very, very yeah, cool to hear. Hard to come by. Yep. Uh, and just end everything else. I know I'm harping on about that, but uh, just another brilliant chat delivered or facilitated by the money of mine team. Delivered by Will, but... Mate, you just can't get this shit anywhere else. For the money miners. Industry leading, cutting edge, unbelievable stuff. <laughs> and pleasure to be of service. On that note, we'll thank a couple of our partners. Did you find this one, JD? You got onto Will, did you? I did, mate. I had mate, a couple you of... are a, an, a guest recruiting specialist. Well, it's awesome, mate, because we wouldn't be able to speak with these people otherwise. But as soon as you say, we'll put a microphone under you, and they're happy to talk to you. 
So it's all good. Mate, thank you from us, JD. Thank you, mate. If we took you out of the pie, we'd be just fucked. <laughs> I'm not so sure about it, mate. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. Right. Thanks all the partners. Ooh, how we had Smeck in there today, the electrical gurus. And we also had KCA, the mining equipment hire gurus. And we JD, did. who else have we got in the little mix here? We have also got to thank Verify. You can give Grant at Verify an email. Get Wet Solutions. Give Maddie Hall a call or an email. And as well, of course, DSI Underground, Anytime Exploration Services, Brooks Airways, and everything else, Brooks. And last but not least, Maddie. K Drill. Hoderoo, Money Miners. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation, and needs.